Welcome to the Holly Bridges podcast. My name is Holly and this is part one of a two-part podcast looking at some truly exciting and inspirational stories of breakthroughs in autism. Tonight we are talking about the most up-to-date changes in autism therapy and how we can make significant improvements in the lives of people with autism. Believe it or not, autism affects almost 1 in 70 Americans and there are similar patterns emerging in developed countries worldwide. Here in Australia, the diagnosis has risen by nearly 80% in the last 30 years. And while the diagnosis has increased, sadly, the strategies and approaches to autism have roughly stayed the same. That is till now. Tonight, we have some leaders at the forefront of these new and thrilling autism treatments. My name is Holly Bridges. I am the author of Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism. And my guests are Dr. Randy Beck from the Institute of Functional Neuroscience. You cannot have a controlled, randomized trial when you're talking about humans. When you expand someone's environmental adventures, they invariably are proud. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, holistic psychiatrist. We talk about holistic approaches in every field of medicine, but we don't really do it. Dr. John Lorne, psychiatrist and trauma specialist. They want to have personalised treatments for everything for, so that you're not just having a generic sort of cookie-cutter approach. And Mike House, survival and disability expert. Staying open-minded, for me, a big part of the picture is, is just remaining curious. Thank you for joining us. And if you want to know more, you can find great resources on my website. Just Google Holly Bridges. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to hear future editions. So first up, I would like to introduce Dr. Randy Beck. Randy, could you tell us about you and your work? Right. Um, I'm the uh, director of the Institute of Functional Neuroscience. And uh, basically what we do is uh, applied clinical neuroplasticity. So we take the current research that is uh, available and apply it clinically to help people with various conditions, including one which is autism, ADHD, global developmental delay, that type of thing. So we're um, really trying to um, take the information that's available in the research world or in the uh, evidence-based world and try to apply it to actual people. That's really what we're trying to do. We've been doing this now for about uh, 12 years, something like that. So we're now approaching tens of thousands of patients, I suppose, that we've uh, been able to uh, apply this type of therapy to. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma. Sanjeev, welcome. Thank you. Could you tell us, so you're doing holistic psychiatry and with autism? Yeah, I work both in public and private uh, system in WA. And in the last few years, uh, I have a special interest in addiction psychiatry. And that's where majority of my work is. And I've realized that a lot of times, we talk about holistic approaches in every field of medicine, but we don't really do it. And uh, in the last few years, I have started using some integrative approaches, particularly using epi- epigenetic work uh, in the area of neurosciences, particularly mental illness, as and started working on their methylation profile gut biome profile and making adjustments and I've seen some huge success rates and seen that people who were initially treatment resistant have now become treatment responsive and which is was initially a quite a big of surprise to me because I was myself skeptical when I launched into this area because it was a completely new area where not much my colleagues have been doing but when I met some interesting people who have been doing work in this area have seen some exciting. Now I can confirm that, yes, I have got few success stories in my books as well. So <laughs> I have no doubts that this modality does work. <laughs> Thank you, Sanjeev. Dr. Lorne, welcome. Would you like to tell us a little about your work? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, I'm another psychiatrist like Sanjeev. Sanjeev. Um, uh, I work mainly with adults, but some children. And I've um, I've got a particular interest in anxiety and trauma-related problems, 
uh, PTSD, but other issues as well across the age span. And I've got a broad interest in all sorts of different treatment approaches, I suppose, quite open-minded in that regard. I use a lot of a lot of non-medication type treatments, acupressure, that kind of thing, um, so what you might call complementary or slightly left of center type treatments, but it's amazing how many of them are starting to develop an evidence base themselves. Um, and more recently, as well as my work at UWA and Fremantle Hospital, I do more and more private practice, which is something I'm developing in the next few months. And I've started consulting at the Institute of Functional Neuroscience. So I'm quite excited to be moving forward, um, learning from the work that they're doing there, but also hopefully adding to, to what they're doing across the age range. And that includes uh, working with uh, children with autism and related disorders. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Mike House. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks for the invite, Holly. Uh, so I'm a survival specialist. I, at one level, take people out into the outback and teach them what to do if they're lost or stranded, which is um, seemingly quite <laughs> different to what the rest of the room is is full of. And I've spent a bit of time as well working with uh, lots of different organisations and individuals in all sorts of sectors and uh, about 20 years doing change kinds of oriented things in the disability sector as well. So it's a pretty diverse spread. And I guess for me, the link between all of those things is that you know, I'm fascinated by the way people respond to pressure, how, how we as a human entity deal with uncertainty and um, decisions and change and newness, and also the, the way that we filter and perceive the information around us really influences what goes on and you know, part of my observation with uh, people with disabilities generally is that they're, they're often constrained by the perceptions of the people around them. Um, so some of my work's been around just challenging that, you know, how we, how we see people, how we see environments and quite often that leads to some really interesting awareness around what people can actually do when the, when the boxes around them are taken away. Thank you. I might just carry on from that because it's quite interesting and, and we've gone around the circle, but it's the outward perception is, is such a constraint, but it also then promotes an inner perception which drives all sorts of thinking capacity and reception to the world. So it would be quite interesting if there's, in a sense, some stories from some of you about what you see when you start playing with, I use the word playing because it's how I think, um, with people with autism and you start stretching out their self-perceptions, you start stretching out the perceptions of the people around them and then watch just how much they can actually grow. And, and for me, the thing is that people with autism have an unlimited capacity to grow and heal is one word, although some people um, don't like that word so much. But Randy, could you talk a little bit about your work in, in terms of perhaps the, the profound changes that you've seen with some people in, mm -hmm. in the autism spectrum? Look, I, th I think it's really interesting that the very first thing that, that uh, this group talks about is the environment. And you are absolutely correct that this, the environment actually drives brain development. And if that environmental reception or perception is altered, it alters the way the mind develops. And uh, there's some very, very interesting work now. I mean, and of course, we've been talking about this for 10 years now when it wasn't sexy to do it. Uh, but now there's a lot of uh, work coming out of John Hopkins, uh, uh, some of our uh, colleagues at Harvard, doing work with interesting ways of changing environmental perception and seeing how that affects people. So I'll give you an example. Using uh, peyote or mescaline, which changes your perception of your environmental input to treat depression. And they're now realizing that people with depression have an altered sense of their environmental perception. And that's why they have, to, that's one of the reasons why they have depression. Now, uh, autism, we're finding several different types of autism. And that's why I don't say autism anymore. I say autisms because there are many more than just the, the one category that we often think of. But one of those, or two of three of those categories, are majorly impacted by environmental changes in perception. So these kids basically, because of a lack, something happens probably around the age of 18 to 24 months, 
in which their environmental system changes. So their perceptive mechanism changes, the perception in their brain changes. They now don't have the capacity to build an environmental picture of their surroundings. So they make it up. The brain actually starts creating its own. And it's flashing in and out of the internally created environment to our environment that we see these abrupt uh, changes in some of these kids. So for instance, uh, you know, parents say to me all the time, oh my God, I saw a brief glimpse of my child. They were there for about 30 seconds and then they're gone again. And that's them coming into our world. See, in their world, they know all the rules. They know what feels good. They know what everything means. But when they come into our world, it's, it's scary. So what we try to do with the environmental stimulus approach is to remind the brain what environmental stimulus was supposed to feel like and how it's supposed to be used. And when we start doing that, the way I look at this is that they start coming into our world more often and they start staying there longer. So I'll let someone else have a go now, but I'm, that's... Mike, you were telling me a story a while ago about a camp you were on mm. and um, one of the guys at cooking. And I thought, I mean, it, it, it's drawing on from what Randy's talking about, but it, it it wasn't illuminating for me. I've seen it before, but I loved it. And I think it, it is illuminating for a lot of people because people get very fixed on what they think mm. people can do. And, and what they can achieve, if you don't mind telling it again. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I guess it, it fits in with part of the work that I've done is to take people into environments that typically in our current sort of culture and climate, people would say that person can't go there, it's not safe, they're not capable, whatever. And, and a lot of those environments have been outdoor or camp-based environments and, and doing activities that are considered to be you know, reasonably out of the box. So we've done things like, you know, abseiling, caving, bushwalking, whitewater rafting, uh, just heading into different towns and staying overnight and all of that. And the particular story you're referring to, one of the young guys that came along with us, his parents and a lot of the people, support people around him assessed him as basically someone not particularly capable of looking after himself. And on this camp... I cooked on the barbecue a bacon and egg breakfast uh, on the first morning that we were there. And on the second morning, this guy woke us up at 5am and he'd basically cooked breakfast for the about 15 people on camp. And it was the first time that he'd ever done that. And he'd, he'd done it essentially from watching me do it once, hadn't asked me anything about it. He'd basically got himself up, started the barbecue, found all the stuff in the fridge, uh, cooked the food and then came and woke us up and said, breakfast is ready, you know? So that, it was just an incredible example of when you take people into a different environment and a different space where the expectations around them are different, they'll often rise to a really different standard of what possible is. And then from there, there's all kinds of things that start to become available to them and the people around them. And, and what you three would probably all say is that changes their neurology in respects as well and if you can actually maintain that you've got a you've got a different person haven't you? you've got a much more capable person did you want to expand on that perhaps Tom? yeah sure i mean it's it's fascinating isn't it and i think this is what's exciting about a lot of the stuff that's happening now um in neuroscience and what we're learning generally which i'm sure the others would like to comment on as well but um, I think what we're realising is how powerful this interaction between um, each of our neuro neurologies is, if you like. So a lot of these examples of things that are going on to different degrees are examples of how we interact with each other quite powerfully. So even just doing good old-fashioned therapy, if you're a good therapist, I mean, a lot of the evidence is that in therapy generally, psychotherapy, um, the most powerful factors are non-specific factors then whichever type of therapy you're doing if you're able to have a very good alliance with another human being a lot happens um, and you know people try to analyze that endlessly but I think from a neuroscience point of view there's a, there's a lot going on now in terms of our understanding of the interaction between two nervous systems just like the way we're talking around the table now uh, and of course that relates back to nurturing as kids how we learn processes, how we interact with our mothers and so on, eye contact and non-verbal things that are very intuitive and non, not conscious. So all of these 
situations involved this and also the work people do with animals is an interesting one because sometimes some youngsters can interact more effectively with an animal's nervous system than another human beings at certain stages and hence the use of horses in therapy and, and other animals can be very effective which sort of leads on to things like polyvagal theory which I know you're very interested in and in how parts of our non-conscious nervous system are very important in this process. So I think all this, this is really, really interesting. We could talk at length, but maybe let someone else jump in on that. And it's very much, though, the nervous system being in a certain state allows a greater or lesser access to your brain capacity, your social capacity, all of that. And, and I guess everyone here is playing with that, more or less. Sanjeev, you're taking it much more from the body angle with your holistic stuff. Can you talk a bit more about how you said you had some profound experiences watching people change. Could you talk about that a little bit? Like in a traditional psychiatry approach, first of all, we all try to put psychiatric diagnosis in a box of either DSM-5 now and ICD-10. And uh, although it was a good concept to begin with, like we had, because the way psychiatric diagnosis evolved, we need to have some classificatory system. Now, and I was part of that training as well. So it's not, mind you, I don't say that these classificatory systems have not done their job. They have done a wonderful job. Even including psychiatric medications have saved a lot of lives. But what is happening now is, and I always say to my colleagues, is that if you are a true student of science, then based on evidence presented in front of you, your opinion about something should change. Which some... I think a lot of people look for an evidence-based practice. And I always say evidence don't land from Mars and Moons. It starts from your clinical practice. If you have found something, just put it in your day-to-day -day practice and then see whether you see a change. Then maybe look for some other colleagues who would believe in your concept. And then a gradually a study or a research can be planned. A lot of times... There are standard benchmarks of research, like, for example, randomized control trial, where we're trying to control a lot of variables. But our body is not like that. Okay, we we 99.9% .9 of our DNA resembles, but 0.1 makes a difference. And this is the DNA which we are talking about. Okay, what about the biome which we are carrying within us? Okay, and now it is proven that the biome is 10 times more than our own cells and genome is almost 100 times. So that makes a huge difference when it comes to the interventions. I've seen that. Could I ask you just um, for our listeners to explain the biome very quickly? Sure. So some people who don't know what that means. Uh, as we all know, now the research has been coming up that our gut is not a sterile place. Okay. Even when the child is conceived, there is an interaction which from the mother's placenta, including the... Uh, amniotic fluid, the child is exposed to certain uh, bacteria or the environment in which the child is growing. Especially when the child is born, particularly if it is a normal vaginal delivery, you get a first seeding of the bacteria which lives mainly in the large part of our intestine. And in reality, about one and a half to two kilos of our weight is actually bugs in our gut. Their numbers outnumbers our cells by 10 times and their DNA outnumbers by 100 times. So in reality, we are living in them rather than they living in us. So this is where the current research doesn't look into. On, and there will be no research which can be ever done where it can identify the various variables around it. So in my practice, what I've started doing in, in the last few years is that looking into just scratching the surface about their metabolism patterns, how they are, whether they are micronutrient status, and also looking into the uh, some gut biome testing, which is available. Some of it is available in Australia. We are quite fortunate enough. And simply based on that, I make certain alterations in the dietary changes. That doesn't mean that I'm stopping the medication which the patient has been taking. What I always use, nutraceutical agents, as an adjunct to the medications. When we do these kind of approaches, then the chances are 
you are making a change in their environment, as Randy was talking about. And once you make a change in the environment, then I think our body has got a resilience capacity to rebound back to its normal state. And this is what where we our current approaches are lacking because we are always looking for an evidence till when it arrives on our doorstep, then only will change. But chances are by the time things would be quite late. <laughs> Very much so. If you if you look at the gut and you're changing the gut and you're changing the energetic structure, do you see the polyvagal theory or how do you explain perhaps the for people who are listening, if if you've got autism and you then you change the gut structure, the microbiome structure, how does that translate to someone being more adept or more socially able? Or how, how do you see that? What, how do they sort of exhibit it? But then how do you explain the connection? And I guess for me, I go down the polyvagal road. I can give you an example of a family friend's daughter who is now five or six years old. This is a young kid who had problems with the speech. And once again, in the mainstream school, she was, she was part of the bunch. And uh, parents were quite proactive seeing the other kids that why she's not performing. She was taken to the general practitioner and then subsequently referred to a, a huge waiting list of developmental pediatrician, which takes, I think I have more than 18 to two years, months to two years, public, particularly in the public system. And eventually gave, got a diagnosis of what they call as autism spectrum disorders. So, so, and then there was a package designed for her, including some speech therapy and occupational therapy. And when that, that family friend came to me, I had few colleagues in Perth who, who were doing uh, particularly work with the young, young children, and especially with autism. So I just gave them a suggestion that, do you mind trying some of these new concepts which are coming up? which will include certain blood tests, including some stool tests, and, and then she might be requiring some dietary changes and nutraceutical supplements. Now, coming back to your question about how the polyvagal theory would have an impact. Now, we all know that there is a 10th cranial nerve, which is called as the vagus nerve, supply the whole of the gut. Okay. And once we make a change in the environment in which this vagus communicate with our brain, then the chances are that you will see some changes in their behavior. Now, this girl which I'm talking about, uh, I don't want to go into specific details, but one of the problems was that she could not sleep at night. Okay. Another issue was that she was, her speech was not very clear. Okay. Now, once we made a change in the environment, I guess, particularly her diet, then not only her speech improved, because what is happening is that like you are changing a structure where her vagus is not, is quietened down, like is not on an alert mode all the time. And then when any intervention, like particularly which Randy is talking about, Mark is talking about, then the chances are that those interventions efficacy will increase several folds when you give that brain a right environment. And there is an intimate connection between brain and gut. And that's why our gut is called as a second brain. So we talk about our primary brain, but the secondary brain is often ignored. And within span of about four to six months now, this girl has started speaking clearly. She can sleep well. Now, the treatment team involved in her care are reasonably convinced that yes, there is a remarkable improvement. But when the parents were trying to uh, explain the topic about making a dietary changes and how supplements. I think people often ignore that those aspects because majority of the time either they don't believe it or even if they do believe, they they would say they have not seen some optimal results. It's quite a new language for us really to start talking about the gut and the brain it's it's becoming and, and neuroplasticity things that a lot of people make sense to a lot of people but they still don't make sense to a lot of other people do you want to expand on that a bit more and um, from where sanjeev was absolutely I, look i think that uh once you wrap your head around the fact that the nervous system the immune system the hormonal system and the uh, system of emotions 
are all one system. We have split them apart so over the years so that we could sort of attempt to understand them, I think. But I think we need to always come back to the fact that they're all one system. If you have a brain problem, you have a gut problem. If you have a gut problem, you have a brain problem. If you have a brain problem, you have an immune system problem. If you have an immune system problem, you have a brain problem. Once you accept that, everything makes sense. It's trying to fight it, and, and people fight it for years and years and years until they suddenly realize, whoa, uh, that's actually the way it works. Now, once you get over that, then you can start seeing how everything is connected. So the polyvagal theory, the connection between all of the autonomic nerves and the brain is the brainstem. So that brainstem has, over evolution, developed massive systems of intercommunication. And they mostly are fancy terms called pontomedullary reticular formation and the mesencephalic reticular formation. I mean, these things will put you to sleep if you try to say these words. But the point is, those systems are there. We never understood them. You know, in lots of, uh, I've taught in lots of medical school classes, I've taught in lots of uh, uh, allied health classes, and people just go to sleep when you start talking about this stuff. But the fact is, that's probably the most important lecture of their life that they should have listened to because that is the connection. So when we talk about brain activity and how autonomic systems and gut systems and immune systems, see, they, the immune system is connected through the autonomic system, through the sympathetic system. The gut is connected through the vagus system. It's all a glorious, absolutely perfect miracle that all this stuff comes together. Can you extrapolate on that in terms of autism? Absolutely. So the, uh, again, the way we perceive our environment, especially at the, I strongly believe there's a critical phase or a critical period in development. And if you don't meet certain milestones, things just don't work right after that. And I think that truly is the coming together of the immune system input, gut input, uh, and brain development, environmental stimulus. So if you don't have those three coming at the appropriate time, and the appropriate amount, things don't work right. So that will develop into a variety of different outward symptoms of the, of the people that are involved. So global developmental delay, autistic, spe autistic spectrum disorder. Um, then we get into the other uh, sort of psychosis type things where brain doesn't work properly. So we can relate with the fact that a schizophrenic's environmental perception is different than ours but we can't relate that an autistic child is or a kid with ADHD or you know, a kid with uh, an immune system problem. So we have to get back to understanding that all of these systems are not only interconnected, but they are one. And as soon as you understand that and believe that and look at research from that point of view, and like Sanjay was saying, you cannot have, you cannot have a controlled randomized trial when you're talking about humans. There is not one human in, I mean, all of us in this room, we could all say, yes, we're all, you know, we've all got autism, but guess what? We're all different types of autism. So when we measure that research result and we put it through the rigorous statistics that we put it through, guess what? There's no change because we're all different. We weren't the same sample. So again, you're, you're, he's absolutely correct. Our research approach to this type of clinical challenge has to change. You've been listening to Holly Bridges' podcast. We continue this discussion in Breakthroughs in Autism in part two. And you can find more on my website, just Google Holly Bridges. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for future editions.